أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خاتم الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد ولعنة الله على أعدائهم ومنكر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي ثم أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن كان كبر عليك إعراضهم فإن استطعت أن تبتغي نفقا في الأرض أو سلما في السماء فتأتيهم بآية ولو شاء الله لجمعهم على الهدى فلا تكونن من الجاهلين صدق الله العلي العظيم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Assalamu alaikum dear brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Again, it's an honor and a privilege to be spending the uh, the evenings of the month of Ramadan with you. Alhamdulillah, we reached ayah number 35 of Surah Al-An'am. And I'll read the translation and inshallah we'll begin uh, our discussion. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is again addressing the Holy Prophet and he says, and if they're turning away is distressing to you, then if you are able to seek a tunnel into the earth or a staircase into the sky to bring them a sign, but if God had willed, he would have united them upon guidance, so be not among the ignorant. Now we mentioned that in the previous verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had mentioned that the Prophet was experiencing deep distress because brothers and sisters we have to understand that as we mentioned Rasulullah he was appointed as a prophet because he has a deep love and compassion for humanity in order to be able to guide humanity you have to love those who you're trying to guide so Rasulullah when he sees people engaging in moral misconduct when he sees them go astray it affects him in the same way that that it affects a parent when a parent sees their child engaging in self-destructive behavior and you find that the prophet was so ambitious that he wanted to guide everyone including those who were vehemently opposed to him because the prophet understood that in order for them to taste true to pros, true prosperity they would have to accept the message that he was propagating so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is reminding the holy prophet that he needs to manage his expectations the holy prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alayhi, would be frustrated with himself he would be frustrated with the disbelievers he probably thought that if he puts in some more effort he could potentially guide the likes of Abu Jahal and Abu Lahab. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is consoling the Prophet. He's telling him that, Ya Rasulullah, you need to manage your, expect your expectations. You are not the problem. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially poses a rhetorical challenge to the Holy Prophet where he says, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you, you know, dig a tunnel into the earth or build a staircase into the sky to bring this ayah that they are requesting? Because the disbelievers time and time again, they're asking for a sign. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet that putting in more effort, bringing them more signs, presenting them with more miracles is not going to result in a different outcome. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Holy Prophet to seek a tunnel into the earth or build a staircase into the sky, it's understood that the Prophet is not able to do such things. And thus, 
this rhetorical challenge reinforces the idea that the Prophet ﷺ has no personal control over people's guidance. That's why Allah, that's why he's called a messenger. He's there to deliver the message, to invite, to warn. Guidance is in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's hands. In fact, there's a beautiful hadith from the Holy Prophet ﷺ where he says, that I have been sent as one who invites, as one who propagates. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, I don't have the power to guide. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he sees that there is someone who is genuine in their quest for the truth, Allah will guide them. The Holy Prophet is there to invite, to call people towards the truth. And then the Holy Prophet, he says, وَخُلِقَ إِبْلِيسُ مُزَيِّنًا وَلَيْسَ مِنَ الضَّلَالَةِ شَيْءٍ Rasulullah says, and Iblis, Iblis is there to seduce, but he does not have the ability to misguide. So you find that the Holy Prophet is saying that, I am inviting you towards guidance. Iblis is inviting you towards misguidance. Neither of us have the power to guide, and neither of us have the power to misguide. So Rasulullah says, I invite you, but guidance is in Allah's, Allah's hands. As Allah says in the Holy Quran, Inna alayna huda. Allah says, it is my job to guide. Ya Rasulullah, you invite, if I see that there is goodness in someone, I will facilitate their guidance. So Rasulullah says, I don't have any control over guidance. Neither does Iblis have any ability to misguide. We both invite. I invite to as sirat al-Mustaqim, and Iblis invites towards the path of disobedience. Now, if you look at the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ شَاءَ اللَّهُ لَجَمَعَهُمْ عَلَى الْهُدَىٰ if, had, if Allah had willed, He could have gathered them upon guidance. Now the question is, why doesn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all people? Why does it say that if He had willed, He would have guided all people? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala definitely has the power to compel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can compel all people to submit to Him. But it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sunnah. His way is that He wants people to come to Him willingly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to compel people to obey Him and worship Him. In fact, even if you look at inanimate objects, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala issues them commandments, you know, awamir taqwini as we call them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even wants the inanimate objects to submit to him willingly. If you look at Surah Fusilat, Surah 41, ayah number 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here mentions this concept of willful submission, even among inanimate objects. So Allah in ayah number 11 from Surah Fusilat, Surah 41, he says, ثُمَّ اسْتَوَىٰ إِلَى السَّمَاءِ وَهِيَ دُخَانِ Allah turned towards the heaven, the heavens, when they were in a gaseous state, they were smoke. فَقَالَ لَهَا وَلِلْأَرْضِ Allah addressed the sky and He addressed the earth. فَقَالَ لَهَا وَلِلْأَرْضِ اِتِيَا طَوْعًا أَوْ كَرْهًا Allah says to the sky and the earth, come to me willingly or unwillingly. And you find that the response is what? Qalata, the sky and the earth, they say, Atayna ta'i'een, that we come to you willingly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants His creation to submit to Him willingly, because this is the, the spirit of true worship. So, the ayah, again, to quickly summarize, is basically consoling the Prophet, that Ya Rasulullah, the problem with the mushrikeen and the kuffar is not you. Don't be distressed. Them refusing to believe, them being adamant 
upon rejecting you has nothing to do with you. It's not that if you bring to them another sign that they're going to believe. It's not that you need to put in more effort in order to guide them. You have to manage your expectations, Ya Rasulullah. I am the only one who knows what's in the hearts. If there are people, if these mushrikeen were sincerely searching for the truth, I would facilitate their guidance. You are there to deliver the message. You are there to give glad tidings. You are there to warn. Ultimately, guidance is in my hands. But you find because the Prophet was so ambitious and he wanted all human beings to enjoy the, to experience the joy of Tawheed and divine worship, he wanted all people to be guided. And he did not want to leave even a single person uh, as a disbeliever. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in ayah number 36, إِنَّمَا يَسْتَجِيبُ الَّذِينَ يَسْمَعُونَ وَالْمَوْتَى يَبْعَثَهُمُ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ إِلَيْهِ يُرْجَعُونَ Allah says only those who hear will respond. Only those who hear will respond. As for the dead, God will resurrect them, and unto him they shall be returned. Now when you read this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's saying that there, are only one, there is only one group who will heed your call, who will respond positively to you. Because the, the, the word innama, the Arab linguist, they call it ada to hasrin, that it's a linguistic device of exclusivity, meaning only this group and no one else. Only those who hear will respond. Now it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of all of the faculties, now obviously we're not speaking about the physical ear. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking about you know the ear of the heart and those who are unable to hear we're referring to spiritual deafness the deafness of the heart now why is it that hearing is mentioned and not you know seeing you know it's Possibly because if you look at all other miracles, if you look at the miracle of Musa السلام, the miracle of Musa was a visual miracle. The miracle, the mu'jizah of Isa, reviving the dead, that was what? That was a visual miracle. In fact, most of the miracles that were brought to communities by the ancient prophets were miracles for the eye. But the Quran, the Qur'an is the ultimate miracle of the Holy Prophet. The Qur'an is what? Is it a miracle of the eye or is it a miracle of the, of the ear? It's a miracle of the ear. And hence, this is potentially why the Qur'an is mentioning that only those who hear, who don't have the spiritual deafness, they will heed your call. Now when it comes to have this, this spiritual hearing, this ability to to internalize the truth, to, to be free of this spiritual deafness is alluded to by the Holy Prophet in a hadith where he says, The Holy Prophet is saying that if you want to acquire my keen spiritual hearing ability, you have to do the following. He says, the reason why you don't hear things that I hear, it's because your hearts are distracted. You're distracted. And then he mentions what? fil hadith. He says, because you talk too much. You are too distracted by this material life and you speak too much. You talk too much. So you find that one of the ways to enhance the ear of the heart is what? To speak less. In fact, there's a hadith that says when Adam السلام, was removed from the Garden of Eden and he dwelled on the earth, he had many children and many grandchildren and they would all gather around him. And the hadith say that they would create a lot of commotion and noise and disturbance. And he would sit there very quietly. He would never 
you know, rebuke them. He would sit quietly until one of his children or grandchildren said to him that, Oh, our father, you're always sitting so quietly. You barely say anything. You know, we, we're jumping and making all of this noise and this commotion, and you sit quietly. Why is that? Adam alayhi salam, he says that when I was removed from the Garden of Eden, from that garden, I began to cry. So much so that depressions appeared on my cheeks. I wept bitterly. So Jibra'il came to me with some advice. Jibra'il came to me with some advice and he said to me, Ya Adam, إذا أردت الرجوع إلى ما حيث كنت فيه فأقلل كلامك. O oh Adam, if you want to go back to that state that you were in, where you were in the presence of your Lord, if you want to go back to that lofty garden, I have one piece of advice for you. Reduce your speech. Don't talk too much. Even physiologically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us more organs of hearing than organs of speech. So the Prophet says, the reason why you don't hear what I hear is because you have hearts that are distracted and you have tongues that are always moving. You talk too much. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, as for the dead, Allah will resurrect them. Now, many commentators of the Quran, they say that the dead here in this context is not referring to a physical death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is referring to the spiritually dead. And in fact, many of those who were in Mecca and Medina, they were spiritually dead. Physiologically, biologically, they were alive, but the Holy Prophet was trying to revive them. He was trying to resurrect them before Allah resurrects them. If you, if you look at Surah Al-Anfal, Surah number 8, Ayah number 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He addresses the believers. He says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu stajibu lillahi wa lirrasul. O you who believe, O you who have joined this faith, Respond to Allah's call and the call of His Messenger. Why? Because we are inviting you towards that which gives you life, that which revives you, that which rejuvenates you. And you find that, you know, human beings, most of the time, they are living in a spiritual comatose. Even though biologically we're alive, in fact, we're dead. In fact, the Holy Prophet ﷺ, in a famous tradition, he says, niyam, that people are asleep. People are sleeping. Even though you see them talking and going about their day and they have conversations with you, the Prophet says, niyam, people are asleep. That when they die, they will awaken. You know, it's ironic that when you go to the cemetery, what do they usually write on the tombstone? Rest in peace. But from an Islamic perspective, you know, what we should really write on the tombstone is what? Now you are awake. Now you are awake. That when you are above ground, you are heedless. You are asleep. You are in a spiritual comatose. Rasulullah says, An-nasu niyam. And then Allah Azza wa Jal in the next ayah, ayah number 37, He says, They say, Why has no sign been sent down unto him? This is what the, the Mushrikeen of Mecca are, are saying. Why, why is there no sign sent down upon him? قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَادِرٌ عَلَىٰ أَنْ يُنَزِّلَ آيَةً وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ O Muhammad, say to them, Surely God has the power to send down a sign, but most of them do not know. Now, the Qur'an makes repeated references to the, 
the disbelievers' skepticism about why no sign is sent to Rasulullah to prove that he is in fact a messenger of God and to prove the truthfulness of the, the message that he is inviting them towards. But you find again, the Quran in many verses indicates that such signs are of no avail because they will continue to stubbornly refuse. When you look, brothers and sisters, all prophets, you know, from a theological standpoint, all prophets are equipped with mu'jizat, evidentiary uh, miracles. Now, as we mentioned, the prophet's main mu'jiza is the Holy Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents the Quran as a book whose beauty and power both in its linguist both linguistically and in its meaning is something that is inimitable that cannot be reproduced allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example in surah al-baqarah ayah number 23 he says wa in kuntum fi raybin min mimma nazzalna ala abdina if you have any doubt about what we have revealed to our servant فَأْتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِّن مِثْلِ Produce one surah that matches it. وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِّن دُونِ اللَّهِ And call upon your witnesses. Now you have to keep in mind, brothers and sisters, that the Holy Prophet, you know, never went to any educational institution. He was not known as someone who read. So no one can accuse him of borrowing from the Torah or the Injil. So you have someone who is unschooled, who never wrote, who never read, who was never known to be someone who associated with philosophers. You know, Mecca was not a learning center in the world. In fact, it was it was in a state of ignorance. In fact, it was called Zamanul Jahili. It's not that you know the Prophet was you know living in Greece among philosophers where someone could you know assume that he borrowed from certain ideologies. Rasulullah was living in the middle of Jahiliya. He never went to any, you know, university, no educational institution. There was no one who lived long enough to say that I take credit for his upbringing. Rasulullah, he never met his father. His father died before he was born. He lost his mother at the age of six. He lost his grandfather at the age of eight. He didn't spend that much time with his uncle Abu Talib. You know, he got married at the age of 25. So you find that he spent very little time. Abu Talib had also, uh, Abdul, uh, Abu Talib had many children that he had to look after. It's not that he was spending all of his time with the Holy Prophet. So you find that you have someone who doesn't receive any formal education, who produces a book that mesmerizes the most educated and the most eloquent in Arabia. It's similar to saying today, there's someone who has never taken a physics class, who has never went to school, and he presents a theory in physics that blows away the minds of all of the physicists today. And he challenges, challenges them and no one can meet his challenge. This, this is something that's miraculous. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says that if you doubt, if you have doubt in what we have revealed to Muhammad, then produce one single surah that is comparable to it. So you find that the requests for signs were disingenuous and they were driven by an attitude of spiritual stubbornness. Moreover, you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the mushrikeen that you're asking for ayat, you're asking for signs of God's omnipotence, of monotheism Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that his ayat are everywhere they're found throughout nature if you look at surah yusuf ayah number 105 Allah says Allah says how many signs are there in the heavens and the earth that you pass by without thinking, without reflecting. Human beings are heedless. The signs are available, 
but human beings are negligent, they're heedless. You know, brothers and sisters, if you've ever been, if you've ever driven, especially through a rural town, you know, sometimes when you're driving on the highway, you see cows on the side of the road, right? You know, sometimes you're driving, you see them, and everybody points out, you know, look at the cows, right? You know, it's amazing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compares heedless people to cattle. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to compare the heedless, if you go to Surah Al-A'raf, Surah 7, Ayah number 179, He describes the heedless. He says, لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have hearts that do not comprehend. وَلَهُمْ أَعْيُنٌ لَا يُبْصِرُونَ بِهَا And they have eyes, but they cannot see. وَلَهُمْ آذَانٌ لَا يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا And they have ears that cannot hear. أُولَٰئِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ Allah says they are like cattle. بَلْ هُمْ أَظَلٌ And they are even worse. They're totally heedless. So when you're driving, even if you're driving at high speeds, you rarely ever see a cow look up at the road. They don't react. You could be driving 100 miles an hour. You zip past them, and the wind blows on their fur, but they continue to graze. That if you, if you think about cattle, they're totally heedless of their surroundings. You see cars driving past, and they don't even flinch. But other animals, you know, you drive, the lizard will go back into its hole. The rabbit will, will jump away. The deer will probably jump in front of your car, right? The dog will lift its head. Other animals are aware of their surroundings. But, but if you look at the cattle, no matter what's going on, cars are driving by, driving by. You could be even a few feet away from them. And they, they're oblivious. They're heedless. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, human beings are like cattle. And even worse, I have filled the universe with so many signs. And just like the cow doesn't raise its head, just like the cows and the cattle are oblivious to their surroundings, Allah says the human being is like that. The human being is like cattle. They're asking for signs, but the signs are all around them. Allah says what in the Quran? We will show them our signs in the skies, in the heavens. Allah is saying, for God's sake, look up. Look up at the sky. You know, there's a beautiful statement from the famous uh, Greek philosopher, Plato. He says, I don't understand how people can come to know God without looking up at the stars. But how many people today actually look up at the heavens? Most people are busy looking down at their phones, right? Allah says, I have, I have filled the, the universe with signs, but they are heedless. That we will show them our signs in the heavens and within themselves until, they, until the truth is evident to them. But people, unfortunately, they are heedless. So you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that I have the power. If you go back to ayah number, ayah number 37, قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَادِرٌ عَلَىٰ أَن يُنَزِّلَ آيَةٌ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully capable. He's able to send down the signs that they are requesting. وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَهُمْ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ But they don't know. What don't they know? Some of the Mufassireen say they don't know that if Allah answers their request and they refuse, punishment will descend upon them immediately because the hujjah will be sealed against them. So God's refusal to honor their request might also be a demonstration of His mercy. If you go again, if you go to the uh, to ayah number eight of Surah Al-An'am, which we already covered, what did the, what did what did the kuffar say to the Holy Prophet? وَقَالُوا لَوْ لَا أُنْزِلَ عَلَيْهِ مَلَكٌ why, is, why doesn't an angel come with the Holy Prophet and accompany him? But what does Allah say? Allah says, if I send an angel, the, the, the case will be finalized against them. I will not grant them any more time. That if 
I send them an angel and they request. If I give them what they want and they reject after the truth has become undeniable, my punishment will descend upon them. So Allah's refusal to grant them their requests is potentially a demonstration of His mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want to you know, show them a miracle that would be damning if they refuse. And then in ayah number 38, Allah says, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَطِيرُ بِجَنَاحَيْ إِلَّا أُمَمٌ أَمْثَالُكُمْ مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ ثُمَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يُحْشَرُونَ Allah says, and there is no creature on the earth or bird that flies with its wings except that they are communities like you. We have not neglected in the book a thing. Then unto their Lord they will be gathered. It's interesting that when you look at this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, there is not a single dabba. Dabba is, is basically a creature that moves, you know, literally it means something that moves slowly on the earth. And this is a reference to terrestrial creatures, the earth-dwelling creatures. So Allah mentions creatures that inhabit the earth, the surface of the earth, and creatures that fly in the sky. Allah says, all of them, all of these animals and these creatures that I have created, they are communities like you. Meaning, there's a lengthy discussion among the ulama as to what does it mean when Allah says, they are communities like you. Does it mean that, you know, socially they have a lot of similarities to you? That they, you know, in the same way that we, that we have a... Uh, division of labor among human beings animals also have division of labor and the same in the same way that we have leaders we have certain forms of governance there are leaders there are governors and the governed rulers and the ruled this is the same in the animal kingdom that there are there is the ruler and the ruled there are other verses in the holy quran that indicate that Animals, and in fact, even inanimate objects have a certain level of consciousness. If you look at Surah An Nur, Surah 24, verse 41, Allah says, Alam tara anna Allah yusabbihu lahu man fi samawati wal ard. Don't you see that everything in the heavens and the earth glorifies Allah? And even the birds that spread their wings in the sky. All of these things, animate and inanimate, they know their salah and their tasbih. Tasbih is glorification. Salah seems to be a reference to a formal ritualistic worship that is offered by the birds. Wallahu alimun bima yaf'alun. You see, brothers and sisters, if you look at the word ummah in the Quran, usually the word ummah is used in reference to a community that has a religious identity. So, for example, if you look at ayah number 143 of Surah Al Baqarah. كُنْتُمْ خَيْرَ أُمَّةٍ أُخْرِجَتْ لِلنَّاسِ تَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَتَنْهَوْنَ عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ Usually in the Qur'an, when the word Ummah is used, it's mentioned in the context of a religious community. So you find that there is religiosity even among the animals. In fact, there's a beautiful tradition from the Holy Prophet and this is this also gives us a fresh perspective on animal rights you know secularists they respect animals and they treat them well because they recognize them as living and breathing creatures but from an, an Islamic perspective animals are actually sacred in our eyes they're not just biologically alive they're not just living and breathing but 
there is a, there is a spiritual dimension to them. There's a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi where he says, Irkabu hadihi dawab salimatan wa tadu'uha salima. The Prophet says, ride on sound animals, meaning that don't embark, don't ride on an animal that is ill. Wa tadu'uha salima. And when you finish riding the animal, let it be, let it graze. In fact, one of the rights of the animal, Rasulullah says that after you finish using it, allow it to roam freely, allow it to graze. وَلَا تَتَّخِذُوهَا كَرَاسِي لِأَحَادِيثِكُمْ فِي الطُّرِقِ وَالْأَسْوَاقِ Rasulullah used to tell the people that do not treat these animals, especially the horses and the donkeys and the camels, the animals that they would ride on, Rasulullah says, do not treat them like chairs where you just sit and you talk and you chatter. فَرُبَّ مَرْكُوبَةٍ خَيْرٌ مِّن رَاكِبِهَا وَأَكْبَرُ ذِكْرًا لِلَّهِ تَعَالَى Allah, the, the Holy Prophet, he says, he says, it could be that what you're riding on is better than the rider. That you're riding on this animal. You, you see that this animal is subservient to me. Rasulullah says, maybe the animal, maybe the animal being rided on, that you're riding is better than the rider. Why? Because the Prophet says, it might be, أَكْثَرُ ذِكْرًا لله. This animal doesn't forget Allah, does dhikr of Allah, while you are heedless. So you think that you are superior to the animal, but in the spiritual world, this animal is doing tasbih and you're the heedless one. In another hadith from the Holy Prophet ﷺ, he says, غُفِرَ لِإِمْرَأَةٍ مُمِسَةٍ The Prophet was speaking about a prostitute who was granted forgiveness by Allah because of a good deed that she did. What was the good deed that she did? غُفِرَ لِإِمْرَأَةٍ مُمِسَةٍ مَرَّتْ بِكَلْبٍ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِ رَكِيٍّ يَلْهَثُ كَادَ يَقْتُلُهُ الْعَطَشِ There was a prostitute who was passing by a well, and beside it there was a dog. It was a very hot summer day. There was a dog who was panting and on the verge of dying of thirst. A dog, not a human being, a dog. So what did she do? She could have just said, you know, it's, a dog, it's an animal. It's just an animal. It's an inferior creature of God. And she could have just went on her way. But Rasulullah says, فَنَزَعَتْ خُفَّهَا She took off her shoes. There was no bucket in the well. She took off her shoe. فَأَوْثَقَتْهُ بِخِمَارِهَا she took off her scarf, Allahu Akbar. In, 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 Zeman, in, in the time of Jahiliyyah, the prostitutes used to wear scarves. They used to cover up. Imagine, imagine how, how what an immodest human society that we live in today. That even women who are known for indecency, at least in public, they would cover up. She takes off her khimar, which is her head scarf. فَنَزَعَتْ لَهُ مِنَ الْمَاءِ فَغَفَرَ لَهَا فَغُفِرَ لَهَا بِذَلِكَ She took off her scarf and she tied it around her shoe. And she dipped the shoe down into the well and she would scoop up water with her shoe and she quenched the thirst of this dog. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, as a result of that act of kindness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't forgive her for one sin. Two, he forgave her for all of her sins because of that act of compassion. And sometimes, brothers and sisters, it's these acts of goodness where Allah gives you the tawfiq. Perhaps this, this woman later on became one of the, the righteous believers. She completely changed her life around. So sometimes don't only look at it as a, a good deed as just an opportunity where you're doing something and Allah is going to reward you in the akhirah. There are many times where you do a good deed and because of that good deed, Allah gives you the tawfiq of hidayah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala going back to the verse, He says, 
وما من دابة في الأرض ولا طائر يطير بجناحيه إلا أمم أمثالكم that the creatures on the earth and the birds in the sky they are communities like you we have not neglected in the book a thing ما فرطنا في الكتاب من شيء what is this kitab that is being referred to here? Many of the Mufassirin, they some say it's the Quran, others say no, it's a reference to al lawh al-Mahfuz, the preserved tablet that contains knowledge of all things. And other scholars, they say no, book here is a metaphor. It's a metaphor for what? For creation. That creation is a book in the same way Books represent the compilation of information and knowledge that existence, alamul wujud, is like a book that contains God's knowledge. It's the manifestation of God's knowledge. And there's nothing that has been neglected or missed in the book of creation. Thumma ila rabbihim yuhsharun. Then unto their Lord they will be gathered. Who is they? Some Mufassirin of the Qur'an, they use this verse as proof that not only human beings will be resurrected, not only jinn will be resurrected, but even what? Even animals will be resurrected. Now I've found that there are, there are, two, there are two understandings here. There are some who say that animals will be resurrected and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they'll, they'll be resurrected because their hisab is related because they play a role in the hisab of man after their judgment is finished Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala returns them to dust this is why at the end of surat an naba the kafir will wish to be like the animals who return to dust وَيَقُولُ الْكَافِرُ يَا لَيْتَنِي كُنْتُ تُرَابًا This is one opinion. Other scholars say no, that animals will be resurrected. They will be resurrected. Because even though animals do not have free will to the same extent that man does, they're not mukallaf in the same way that we are, they have a lesser degree of taklif. And therefore, even the animals will be resurrected. They're not mukallaf in the same way that man is mukallaf, but they have a very minimal taklif upon them and they will be resurrected. So Allah is saying that I am going to resurrect even the birds in the sky and the animals that roam the earth. Do you think that I'm not going to resurrect you, O disbelievers of Mecca? Allah says everything is going to return to me. The small, the tiniest creatures on earth, and even the birds in the heavens, everything will come back to me. Thumma ila rabbihim yuhsharun. Inshallah, I think we'll conclude here. If there are any uh, questions, inshallah, we'll take them now. I know it's a lot to digest on uh, on an empty stomach. Any questions or comments? Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, uh, um, so, um, at the beginning of your speech today, the, um, you mentioned in the Ayah 35 um, that uh, and that uh, Prophet needs to. Uh, Allah is mentioning to Prophet that, that he needs to uh, manage his uh, his expectations. No, that that part. Um, so my question is, why is uh, why is Allah disclosing this com this communication with the Prophet uh, in the Quran? Is that because there is no other way for for um, um, you know for for this information to be transferred, or is that because it's it's there for us to take a lesson? You know, de definitely. You know, number one. Quranic revelation is not the only mode of communication between Allah and the Holy Prophet. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not everything that was revealed to the Prophet is Quran. I mean, that's why we have 
what is called Hadith Qudsi, for example, right? You know, the, the Prophet was informed of an assassination attempt when he was in Mecca. You know, we don't see this, you know, explicitly, you know, we don't see a, a Quranic verse telling the Prophet that you need to escape because, you know, there is an assassination plot. So there are other ways in which that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala communicates to the Prophet outside of the realm of the Holy Quran. But absolutely, you know, this, this ayah is mentioned as part of the Quran because there is there is a lesson for us. And, per, and there, obviously there are many lessons embedded in each each verse of the Quran. But but one lesson is again for us to also manage our expectations. You know, for you know, Rasulullah is is he, the, the guide for humanity. You know, sometimes in our own communities, for example, we start, you know, right, a tafsir class every Tuesday. And we think that, you know, inshallah, we're going to have tens of people attending every week, week after week after week. That's not going to happen, right? We also have to learn how to manage our expectations, right? And if you, if you look at Nabi Nuh, Nabi Nuh, alayhi salam, he preached to his community, to his community for 950 years, 950 years. At the end of his tenure, his prophetic tenure, what happened? He was able to recruit 80 people, which means that every 12 years, every 12 years, Nuh has a new convert. A new convert. Now you and I, you know, if, if, you, if you appointed someone to be the head of your religious department and they only get one convert every 12 years you probably fire him right Nuh alayhi salam you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala trains him to manage his expectations that you know you're not going to have people coming to you in throngs in flocks that you you put in the effort and again you know you put in the effort leave the results to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but again because of the prophet is so compassionate and he he has this desire to guide all people you know so the prophet needs to be reminded you know it's not that the holy prophet forgot it's he's so zealous and passionate about this about guiding humanity that he needs to be reminded by allah that you're not the problem you're not the problem you're not there's not you're not missing an ayah there's not another miracle that if you were to show them they would be guided you have to understand that there are people who are just not interested in the truth. They're heedless. They're like the cattle. No matter what you do around them, it's just gonna blow. It's just gonna blow their fur, and they're gonna go on with their lives. So I think, at least for me here, the key is, you know, managing your expectations. You know, uh, knowing that guidance is on, on Allah's hand. Sometimes we get frustrated with family members. You might have a sister, a daughter, a wife who is not as religious as you want. You know. Conversely, you might have a husband who's not, you know, uh, practicing Islam as you see fit. You get frustrated, but you're not the guide. You're not the one who guides. Sometimes it's no matter what you do, you're not going to change the outcome. You do your taklif. You fulfill your responsibilities. Allah says, I will handle it. Guidance is with me. In the same way that Iblis cannot misguide, you and I, we can't guide. Iblis invites towards deviance. We're trying to invite towards goodness and righteousness, and in the end, Allah is muqallib al qulub. Is it clear? Again, this is there could be many other lessons. I'm just sharing with you, you know, what what I understand from the the practical lesson that I take from. It. So another question um, in um, Ayah 36, you. Um, 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 you um, mentioned the, sorry, that was uh, Surah Yusuf, Ayah um, 105, that you mentioned uh, that Allah is, is comparing the, you know, the headless people to the cattle. No. Um, so, so my question is, I mean, if, if I look at myself, um, I'm, it's a little bit scary for me to think about, you know, what I'm seeing during the day and, you know, the days are passing. And we are seeing all these signs from Allah, but we are not really thinking about it. Um, and sometimes, if I read, um, you know, if I read um, a du'as from the Masumin, and there, there, it's it's amazing to see how you know how different you can look at the same thing that you're looking at. Sure. Um, so, what can we do? What can we do to improve our the, the way we are looking at the world? 
you know, how, your question is, how do we become more, you know, contemplative, more reflective? Correct. You know, it's 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 a cha it's a challenge for me as well. You know, I, I'll, I'll admit it that you know sometimes we go through the day and you know we're just so engrossed in our daily routine. You know, but but I think what what could help is that you know you know doing what Imam uh, Al Kalam alayhi salam recommends is that to evaluate ourselves at the end of the day. You know, ask yourself, you know, you know, what did you accomplish today? You know, what are the good things that you did today? What are the things that you should have avoided? So I think if you just raise your your level of uh, of uh, of self scrutiny, I think that and you know perhaps even make a uh, a commitment that today I'm going to be more you know uh, more attentive, I'm going to be more reflective. You know I'm going to spend you know instead of you know uh, you know I'm going to spend at least five minutes a day just reflecting. You know tafakkur is important. You know if you look at most religious traditions. You know, they recommend meditation. Meditation is what? You know, just kind of draining, you know, flushing out all of the, the mental distractions and, and focusing. Now, unfortunately, with our salah, we're, we're more distracted in our salah than probably any time, right? <laughs> so sometimes we need to get into the habit, you know, just, just like, the, you know, the guy who says, Sheikh, you know, every time I, uh, I misplace my, uh, my keys, I do a nafila because when I pray, I remember. Right, he does in salah. He remembers where he places his keys because our minds are so scattered during our prayers. So I think that you know maybe setting aside a few minutes a day, you know, before you go to sleep in the morning, you know, just sit there, collect your thoughts, and make a conscious effort. For example, to to notice one of Allah's signs in nature. You know, make 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 a, a commitment that I'm going to make it a point. To watch the sunset today that when it becomes dark outside I'm gonna go for a few minutes and just glance up at the sky being more connected to to creation is a way to, to make us more contemplative when Allah describes the the believers he says they think about the heavens and the earth to think about the heavens and the earth, you actually have to look at the heavens and the earth. The problem is we ne we're, we're always looking at our devices. That we need to, you know, that's why it's it's mustahab to, to see the crescent moon, right? The the timings of our prayers are connected to what? The, 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 uh, the rising and the setting of the sun. It's as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be conscious of where the sun is. When we begin with the, uh, the the Islamic month, Allah wants to be Allah wants us to be conscious of the phases of the moon. So Allah here is just through our worship, He's connecting us to two of His signs, which is the sun and the moon. You know, don't think ayat are just the ayat of Quran. Ayat are throughout the universe. So perhaps you know that's a way to kind of you know become more attentive. So al-ayatu billah, we're not like the uh, the cattle who never. Notice the cars that are speeding on the highway. <laughs> Hopefully not. Yeah, that was a wonderful response. Thank you. Um, Sheikh, can you throw some light on um, the takrif of animals? I didn't quite get that part. So I, again, this this is a theory among some of the uh, the commentators of the Quran and theologians. Again, there, there are some there are some scholars that say they have no takrif. They operate solely based on uh, on instinct. You know, sometimes you see animals, you know, do, you know, at least from our perspective, they do very horrible things. You know, you see infanticide even among uh, among animals. You know, if you look at, if you study, uh, if any of you have, have studied like gorillas, you know that there's a lot of violence that goes on in the animal kingdom beyond just food. You know, there's a lot of killing and bloodshed that takes place in the animal kingdom, and it doesn't seem like it's just about, you know, survival. You know, sometimes it's about asserting dominance. So perhaps Allah Subhanahu wa Taala may hold certain animals responsible for engaging in uh, in acts of violence or harming other animals where it wasn't necessary for their survival. You know, they have you have your food, you have your shelter. Why are you killing this? This innocent uh, creature. 
So perhaps their taklif might be very minimal in that regard. That it's just about you know punishing them for going beyond what they need and you know uh, you know uh, carrying out violent acts towards other vulnerable creatures when it wasn't necessary for them to do so. Thank you. And I'm sure you see even I mean, sometimes you see two two animals. One is a lot nicer than the other, right? One is a lot more gentle. Others are more aggressive. You know, perhaps perhaps it's not only instinct. Maybe there is a level of consciousness there. There's 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 a certain level of free will that's there that Allah has allowed them. And and based on the level of free will that He has given them, He'll His hisab with them will be based on the uh, you know proportionally to the the hurriya, the level of free will that they were granted. Mulana, you, you also mentioned that uh, the animals, uh, as it's in, in Quran, uh, that the animals know their tasbih and salah. Can you comment that again uh, on this? Uh, it's not very clear to me what that so, is. So tasbih, Ahlul Bayt salam, and all other ulama, they've, they've defined tasbih as tanzih. And tanzih basically means to negate imperfection, to negate limitation from God. So tasbih is basically the the process of refining our understanding of God. This is this is essentially the, the meaning of tasbih. Tasbih is basically to negate all imperfection from the Creator. To declare his perfection. Now, again, tasbih here with respect to the uh, the uh, the animals and inanimate objects. The Quran mentions that you know min shayin illa yusabbihu bihamdi. There is not a single thing, but it does tasbih. But what's the problem? Walakin la tafqahuna tasbihahum. But you are you don't understand their tasbih. You cannot perceive it. There are some scholars that say that the tasbih of the trees and the mountains is simply the idea that they're fulfilling their role in creation. That they're obeying the natural laws that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed. That's one opinion, but I disagree with that. Because the Quran explicitly says, you don't understand their tasbih. So by saying their tasbih is X, Y, and Z, you're, tr you're attempting to understand it. So... They're engaging in this tasbih. There is a consciousness. There is, there is a. You know, I don't want to use. I don't, I don't want to use the word thought process, but there is an awareness of God's majesty among animals and among inanimate objects. This tasbih is declaring God's perfection, negating imperfection from Him. And salah, it could be that you know. So tasbih could be the informal worship that's offered, whereas salah. It could be, Allahu A'lam, it could be that, you know, just as we have, you know, formal worship in the form of daily prayers, you know, animals might have, you know, some rituals that they uh, that they participate in to offer their uh, their worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, you know, beyond that, I, I can't comment. I don't know. Allah says, you don't understand their... Uh, you don't perceive and understand their uh, their glorification, but this is potential, possibly uh, one of the meanings. So, it, I mean, and, and it's really a beautiful thing that you know when you stand in your salah, when you're doing tasbih, you're essentially synchronizing yourself with all of creation. So, the one who doesn't pray is actually swimming against the current of creation, whereas the one who does tasbih and dhikr you're you're moving in the right direction you're moving towards allah with the rest of the cosmos thank you okay Mulan, i think um, i think we are done with questions may allah bless you guys inshallah you guys have an enjoyable iftar and i look forward to uh landing in seattle tomorrow and inshallah hopefully seeing you on friday inshallah yeah, thank you very inshallah. much inshallah. Thank you.